Hi, everyone. <laughs> Hello. Hello, uh, Rahel. Welcome. Nice. Nice to see everyone. Um, yeah, I think um, we are um, we are going to start with a short extra bootcamp introduction, as usual in our open lectures. So uh, yeah, and then Berenice and Crimson will start in around five minutes. So let me start with that. And yeah, please let us know where you're all um, zooming in from. <laughs> Uh, I, I really like that um, idea in the beginning that someone said we need this Zoom plugin to show all the locations on a map. <laughs> that would be really cool. Um, yeah, so. Can you see my screen correctly? Yes. Yes, looking very nice. Okay, yeah, so so welcome to our XR Pro event series. I hope you've all seen the link on Eventbrite. Um, feel free to also sign up to our future events. Uh, we may have, um, if uh, if you all like it, we all may have more events about ChatGPT, inviting different developers to talk about their experiences. So feel free to also register to our newsletters and follow us on Eventbrite. And also, if you want, um, we are usually uploading some of the open lectures to YouTube. So um, yeah, please also follow us on our Exa Bootcamp YouTube channel if you find this interesting. So who are we actually? Well, um, as the name Exa Bootcamp is already telling, uh, we are teaching virtual reality and augmented reality. And also now we have a heavy um, point on mixed reality skills as well. And uh, our alumni, especially from our foundations and prototyping bootcamp are now working at very, very cool companies in very, very exciting positions. So if you're interested in starting or um, yeah, improving your current career in XR, we invite you to look at our courses and um, yeah, and let us know. We actually have an info session about our courses, about our bootcamp and our, our masterclasses right after this open lecture. So feel free to also join that one. And um, yeah, we're also sharing the link to the info session in the chat. And uh, yeah, I just want to highlight that um, for the beginner level bootcamp, um, we have students from very, very different backgrounds actually joining us and um, also having very impressive careers afterwards. So for example, there is Sadik, he was working at a university in Italy before. And uh, after our bootcamp, he got an offer from Apple uh, to work as spatial engineer there, uh, which he rejected actually because he prefers to um, work in robotics. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it, it was a great success story. And then Michael, who was a software developer and then um, now is working at Meta as a um, extra prototyper. And we have Emma, and she's actually, I think, the most impressive one because she didn't have any coding knowledge before signing up to our bootcamp. And uh, yeah, I mean, some of you may have played the virtual reality game Moss, and now she's working at the stu studio, which is um, yeah, which has has done this game and um, as a as a um, um, technical artist. Um, yeah, so um, of course uh, you can come to our info session right after this, but just to give you a small overview over the um, bootcamp. So it's a four month program. Um, there is a um, entrance level test, a C sharp test, which you would have to um, have to pass in the beginning. But as I just mentioned, you can come even though you don't have any coding knowledge. And um, and to pass the eligibility test, you basically can sign up to our free C sharp course, um, which takes like around forty hours, I would say, if you. Really don't have any coding knowledge before and then you will pass the c-sharp test and uh, then then you're all set to start with our extra foundations course which is the first two months um, where you basically learn c-sharp and unity and then the actually core of our course is the XR prototyping course, which is the last two months of the program where you just prototype. So um, every week you're prototyping one project and that can either be with an industry partner of ours who's giving you the briefs, or you can of course choose to, um, yeah, to just uh, prototype your own ideas, your own XR ideas. And then you're also like um, for the last four weeks of the, pro of the program, you're getting together in groups 
and prototyping one, as we call it, MVP, one minimum viable store ready um, VR project together with your um, fellow students. And um, yeah, so so if you um in this phase, if you are looking to um yeah, basically work with one of our industry partners, we have, for example, um, um one of the industry um, partners is Pearson, and they are also always looking at our students to hire them if they are basically working on one of the prototype ideas that Pearson is giving to, to the students in the last phase of the program. So you directly have these um yeah, these direct connections with our industry partners and also learn how to work with real briefs, um, with real project partners, with real project managers, basically evaluating based um, you based on the quality of your prototype of prototypes you are delivering. And um, yeah, I mean, feel free to um, to to check our trust pilot uh, page and read our reviews. Um, we also have some of them in our curriculum, which you can download. And um, yeah, we're very happy that our students are very happy with our programs, and um, that yeah, that we can enable so many great careers in the XR industry. And uh, yeah, what's actually our philosophy behind? Um, so of course you can learn XR development just by signing up to Udemy um, courses. You can learn it by just watching YouTube videos. Of course you can do that. Um, but in terms of accountability, in terms of learning efficiency, um, it's best to always learn together with others to learn in small groups who hold you accountable to your progress. So you don't get distracted um, and you are basically always working with assignments and with homeworks and together with others it's just much more easier to learn efficiently and it's also much more fun so um yeah so there is this content hierarchy of bullshit with um uh, which Wes Cow has created she's a very famous um um learning uh, development manager and it's very true as i think so yeah that's why we basically decide that all our courses we are offering are cohort based so you're always in small groups and can learn together um and of course together with our trainers and mentors and yeah, I mean, have you already shared the link to our free C Sharp course? I'm just like, yeah, um, just to give you a little, um, yeah, first experience before signing up for a huge program like a bootcamp. It's always best to try yourself and to just like, yeah, um, also learn or also see if it's actually fun for you to to program. And for us, um, programming is actually a heavy focus in our program because that's um, we are very um, heavy on skill to job programs, and um, the programming part, the coding part, is mostly the um, a part which gets you the job because that's the most in-demand skill even for designers even for um, project managers if you have some coding knowledge that always helps you and um, yeah, we are very, very proud on our um, XR developers, XR creators community. I would also like to in invite you to join our Discord server, um, where you can basically ask any question you have about um, XR development, about the C# course if you're joining, and yeah, just network and connect with other people all around the world. And yeah, so um, there's also many, many companies which are regularly, especially sending um, developers to our advanced level courses. So if you're, um, yeah, that's also like one of the advantages we can offer to you that all these people which are coming to our advanced level courses are looking to hire as well. So they are also looking at our um, more junior graduates. And yeah, our, our um, what's also very um very distinguishing for XR Bootcamp is that all our trainers and mentors, they have side jobs. So um, no one is full-time um, as a trainer at XR Bootcamp. It's everyone is basically running their own successful XR studio or they are working at Ubisoft or at different um, yeah, XR industry companies. So they always, always stay up to date with what, what is actually currently required in the industry and what's actually currently in demand skills. So um, yeah, for us, it's very important that all our trainers are actually um, yeah having their real work, work on the side so that no one is actually teaching something which was current two years ago. And as you all know, the industry is um, changing very, very quickly. Uh, yeah, Fehan, do you want to um, add something about our students' projects? Yes, definitely. Thank you, Rahel. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Uh, it's quite exciting to see hundreds of people again in, uh, in another open lecture. We are organizing quite frequently now. We thought uh, the the commitment towards these open lecture attendance uh, will may drop, but it's actually increased and it becomes like a, a avalanche right now. So we are really happy to see every one of you. Um, as Rahel mentioned, actually, um, we are also uh, in an interesting uh, session today because the 
graduates and students of our programs and mentors of our programs are actually directly contributing to the guidelines, to the open lectures. Bernie Crimson is, uh, they are actually uh, one of them. Uh, we will introduce them as well. Actually, this project has been um, created by Bernice and her team. It was called NoFOB MR, I guess, right, Bernice? Yes, so, yes, um, I remember Ambika and the others. Who, who Ambika and Asta. Asta and Fatma and Asta, yeah. They, they, they created this with three people in only two weeks. So they were not knowing pass through uh, before they learned all the SDK presence platform uh, by themselves. So at the end of the day, um, as Rahel mentioned, the goal is you may have lots of SDKs launching right after even graduating from our programs, but we really want you to be self capable of learning the new SDKs by yourself. And uh, hack way, hack your way through uh, all these new challenges, new SDKs, new platforms. So this is actually a great uh, example that actually get the recognition even from Meta team uh, on social media. So we are really proud of these uh, projects. It's being created in a, such a short period of time uh, and uh, with like a multiple people. So uh, happy to also talk further on the info session as well. Uh, as Ryan mentioned, we are always in a, like you can always talk with our uh, team, our graduate students on the XR creators and understand how does it look like to be uh, in this kind of a cohort based committed commitment programs, uh, like four months programs. And uh, today I would like to actually uh, give the stage to Bernice and Crimson and um, everyone is talking about ChatGPT after we posted the guideline created by Bernice and uh, the team. Uh, we get a lot of uh, interest and demand and we decided, okay, I think it deserves one open lecture so we can like a, in a comfortable way, we can discuss and even get questions that you may have. So um, today is the day, prepare your questions. One uh, small uh, reminder, please, please, please ask your questions in the Q&A tab. Uh, don't post on the chat window because it is very difficult um, to uh, find for us. Mm -hmm. So please uh, post your already start posting your questions on QA. So as I mentioned, Bernice and Crimson was also through our boot camps and they are also working very hard on uh, multiple projects on multiple platforms. They have been on the uh, in industry. Uh, on the app development side for a long while. And now they already focus on building amazing XR apps. So I would like to welcome uh, both of them. I think Bernice, you will start with the art side first, and yes. then we will leave the coding side to Crimson right after. So um, stage is yours, Tim, and feel free to share your screen. Yeah, just a second. Thank you very much, um, Ferhan. I will share my screen. Um, yeah, you tell me that. you see something, I guess. Yeah, if you oh, make it via show, so we can okay. make it full screen. My Perfect. first slide here. Okay, Perfect. thank you. Thank you, Ferhan. Hi, everyone. I'm Berenice um, Terwey from Germany, a self-employed Unity and XR developer and prototyper with uh, several years of experience in AR. I'm really thrilled to be here, and uh, thank you very much for joining us. Hey everyone, I am uh, Crimson, uh, Crimson Wheeler. I am the co-founder of IC Studio. Um, I have over a decade of software experience or software development experience and I am an XR developer and game designer. Um, so in this, in this presentation, uh, you will hear Bernice uh, talk about ChatGPT and using it to generate art prompts. Oh, sorry. Um, maybe are. maybe with uh, direction uh, direction arrows, it will be easier to navigate. Yeah, so you'll hear Bernice uh, use ChatGPT um, to generate prompts for uh, Midjourney, Refusion, and a couple of other AI uh, programs. 
and then you will see a live demo. And I will be talking about best practices for using ChatGPT to increase your efficiency with software development. Yes, and afterwards we will also um, doing a question, a Q and A. Okay, thank you so much, um, Crimson. Sorry for the confusion. Um, I got twelve no my errors here. Okay, um, first I'll be giving an overview um, um, why and um, how ChatGPT can assist in writing prompts. Next, um, I'll compare the output of generative AI with and without ChatGPT. I will walk you through through my technique for using ChatGPT and Midjourney, including a short live demo. And finally, I will share a few resources and links I found so far. So without further ado, let's dive in. I get here some trouble with my errors. It's um... so okay. This is the right slide. Um, as we all know, um, imagery and multimedia content play a crucial role in the development um, of any project, from ideation and uh, prototyping through to release and promotion. And uh, ChatGPT can assist in generating and refining art prompts, which then um, can be utilized by another generative AI. These um, processes are commonly referred to as text to image, text to vector, or text to sound. Um, text of 3D and uh, so on. Um, during the ideation phase and at project start, mood boards um, are always an essential medium to communicate with uh, 3D artists, UI and sound designers and everyone else involved. Also uh, during prototyping and development phase, we need imagery and assets in any case. With um, text prompts, we can generate uh, spherical images, for example, for AR portals, which are very popular. Also, um, equirectangular images and panoramic textures, seamless patterns, um, and also UI design, as well as music and uh, soundtracks. Additionally, um, ChatGPT can generate basic code for shaders in Unity. And with the help of announced um, generative AI, like the one from Masterpiece AI and the one by Google, we'll be able to even generate 3D models and uh, motion from text prompts. Finally, um, teams are responsible for app and product release, marketing and promotion need imagery too. So let's examine two images, one generate, generated without and one with the help of ChatGPT. On top, um, you see on this slide my initial prompt, which um, consists um, just of a few keywords. And for your reference, the pictures on this slide just uh, showcase the style of 17th century flame paintings. In this case, um, they are by Rembrandt and Brüchel, um, but I haven't um, input them into generative AI at all. And it's just to show you the style. So on the next slide, um, you see on the left, um, you can see my original prompt, then fed into Dull E by OpenAI and the resulting image. Um, you can see that there's no background in the image. The turf wagon appears unnatural and the ground um, lacks detail in my opinion. And um, with the help of ChatGPT, um, the image on the right shows, um, uh, shows an improvement um, because ChatGPT provided a more detailed and descriptive image caption, but based on my input, um, and it added attributes, adjectives, emotional context, and a style description. Um, finally, a feeding that result from ChatGPT into the LE resulted in an even more refined image because the background now and the wagon um, appear complete. Um, the lighting is improved and the color palette matches the style of the um, 17th century flame paintings, which you have seen before. Let's take a look um, at another example, utilizing um, a different prompt for mid-journey in this case. Um, as you can see on the left, my original prompt resulted in a bright and colorful design, reminiscent of a computer game. Um, however, after feeding my prompt, into ChatGPT and using its reply, um, the result on the right presents a more complex scene with um, improved lighting and um, in inviting 
atmosphere. Now, um, you probably wonder how to achieve this. Uh, first, um, let me explain the general structure of an art prompt. Um, we usually start by the desired content type, in this case, um, an image, but you can also um, indicate a photo, or painting, or collage, or whatsoever, then followed by a description um, or image caption. Um, we also provide information about the um, desired style and eventually about the format and resolution, but um, this depends on the generative AI. Now, to create a which art prompts, we can use, for example, the following techniques in combination. Uh, first, we have to tell ChatGPT which role it has. In my case, I always feed in, act as a prompt engineer. Then <clears throat> tell, um, it shall ask questions before replying to better understand the task. And uh, the next um, point is very important. I teach ChatGPT the guidelines from the documentation of the other generative AI. For example, you can grab um, from Midjourney on the website, the prompting notes section, where um, you may find um, hints and advices how to um, craft a prompt. I copy that and paste it um, to ChatGPT so that ChatGPT learns um, this kind of stuff. Then um, seed a few words and phrases that best describe the, um, the desired artwork and um, provide um, historical references or art movements that can influence the overall style and aesthetic of the artwork. Um, also provide um, some emotional context for the artwork, uh, such as mood or tone, and um, use um, extracts and parts of the project brief and storyboard elements for example, a plot, a characters, um, and settings. Um, and you can tell ChatGPT it shall provide specific attributes such as color, shape, um, texture, and composition. Um, optionally, you can um, let ChatGPT condense its own output in case it's too long. And in the other generative AI, for example, Midjourney, if possible, provide a sample image or a set of images that showcase the desired aesthetic of the artwork. For example, with Midjourney, it's possible to input uh, such um, reference images. In this case, an art prompt um, has the following structure. At the beginning, the image prompt um, in, in the form of um, a URL, then our text prompt and followed by optional parameters, which are specific um, here at uh, Midjourney. Okay, I think now it's a time for a short live demo. Let's generate some art. Um, I've already prepared a kind of project brief with um, ChatGPT. It's um, a language learning game in VR in a bustling city where um, the player interacts with NPCs and interactive hotspots. So we are going to generate prompts for the mood board, especially an artsy environment design, a seamless pattern texture, which we always need in the 3D. Um, a soundtrack, and if time is left, a basic shader code for Unity. So I will um, stop the presentation mode here. And we go to OpenAI um, and ChatGPT. I hope it's not down. So here you can see the thread I've um, started from scratch. Um, ChatGPT gave me some input, it um, described here um, the, the language learning game in VR. Um, I asked for a this, um, description of the environment, the um, NPC, for example, and um, this is the last one, um, the last prompt um, and result I've received from ChatGPT. So what I have to do now is um, I have to um, tell um, ChatGPT it shall switch the role from a game designer role to prompt engineer. So I've prepared my prompt here so that I don't have to type and lose time. I say, good, stop acting as a game designer and act now as a prompt engineer until, you tell, uh, until I tell you to top, uh, stop this role. I hit enter. JGPT says um, it understood. Uh, and I can feed in my next, um, my next prompt. 
I have copied, um, I will copy the guidelines uh, from Midjourney, but first I will tell that this is not yet an art prompt, but um, the, um, the guidelines. I have to copy them here. It's a bit long for paragraphs here from Midjourney. Yes, I are, and here we go. Okay, ChatGPT learns it. And I can generate the first art prompt for the, uh, for the environment. I tell, write an art prompt about the game environment of the language learning game that you suggested earlier. The nice thing with ChatGPT is that it remembers um, the previous um, conversation. So um, let's hit enter and see what's, what ChatGPT will tell. Create an illustration of a bustling city, perfect for language learning. Subject, that's nice, bright, cheerful, daytime. Okay, it might be a bit too long for mid journey, um, but we could try and just copy this prompt, this text as a prompt to mid journey. Here's my mid journey um, account. What I've already done here is um, I've uploaded um, my image prompt. Um, this is a painting by Fernand Léger, uh, um, a famous painter of the 20th century uh, from France. Um, I like um, its abstract um, style here and, and the colors. And I want our um, environment um, for the language learning game um, in the same style. So. I will start by the typical prompt in mid journey, imagine. And then everything I have to do is quite straightforward. I just drag um, this image into the prompt field. You see it will add the um, URL of the image. And I paste the result, the reply by ChatGPT here. And then I can give some parameters. Um, that the quality will be just at half um, resolution. I hit enter now, and now we have to wait. It should start within one minute, uh, usually. Um, some, some patience is necessary here. In case um, it's too long, sometimes um, too long text isn't um, the best um, solution in Match Journey, you can ask a ChatGPT to um, condense um, the answer, which we will try later after this one. So uh, the process has started here. It has already finished 60%. And here we go. I will zoom in. Okay, you see um, the style is quite um, similar to Fernand Léger. We have um, bright um, colors. Um, it, it's a city with a sky, a scrapers. Um, it's like um, ChatGPT as um, su suggested as game designer. We can open also in a browser, but I won't do it. Um, you can open it in the browser and then save um, the, the four images here. Okay, we can try um, with a ChatGPT and tell it it shall condense um, this long description. Condense your last reply a bit i will copy this here head over to discord start the image prompt um I need the image prompt too. I will just copy this URL and put it in front of the text prompt. And I will ask, uh, add some parameters here. Okay, here we go. Maybe it will look a bit different.
Next, um, I will also create um, an image uh, for the principal NPC and uh, show you um, how we can get some more diverse uh, results. Um, you, you see here um, four images, um, square images, um, but we can get um, more diversity. Okay, it looks a bit different, um, but um, I like both. It's difficult to say which one I would prefer. Okay, let's um, let's go to ChatGPT again and um, put in a different prompt. I now want a description for the NPC character. Okay, um, I don't want an illustration. I will later um, substitute it by, by a painting or image, which is a bit more general. Don't forget to um, praise ChatGPT by hitting here the uh, thumbs up button um, or even um, giving some comments and feedback because ChatGPT will learn uh, from this kind of feedback um, with reinforcement learning. And this will help um, improving ChatGPT. Um, Discord. Oh, no. First, the prompt, uh, the command image, imagine. Um, then, our create, I will uh, create a painting. I will create an image. And we need the uh, image prompt just by copy paste the URL. And I will add and append once more the quality. I don't need a full quality. And um, we can also append another parameter, for example, chaos. And I set it to 30. It must be a value between 30 and 100. So let's see what's, um, what the result will look like. Uh, 30 um, is not a very high value, um, but the higher the value, the more diversity you will get. <clears throat> uh, well, in the meantime, we can um, let GPT condense uh, this output, condense. Okay, this is the result. Um, yeah, yes, it's correct. I wanted a female NPC principal character um, in the style of phenology. This worked. Um, I can also, um, yeah, I will. I want to show you what will happen if we um, give an input um, value for the parameter of, of um, 90, for example so that we get more diverse, more diverse um, results. I will copy it again. Oh, I forgot image, image prompt. Oh, sorry. Imagine. I'm glad that it's working and that the server isn't down right now so that we can see the result in real time. 
um, chaos means um, that the initial um, noise pattern from which um, the generation of an image starts um, is randomly um, very diverse and different. So um, the, the um, starting noise image won't be the same. Um, and therefore, the res resulting and generated images um, are very different here too. Um, I think it's, it's clear. You see uh, that we have um, different faces, different characters. Um, the, the result um, are very different. So this um, you can you can um, control it by this parameter. Good. Um, now let's um, let let me show you that we can also um, generate um, seamless patterns, which we always need in the 3D world in Unity for our XR projects. So um, we will write um, and generate another kind um, of of text prompt. Go back to ChatGPT. I say it's nice here. Um, and we feed in for texture generation uh, this prompt to ChatGPT, write a prompt for an image, um, which there'll be a seamless um, pattern later. I won't feed it um, into um, Mid journey, you can do it um, because mid journey has also a parameter um, which is called um, tile um, to generate seamless patterns. But um, in, in some cases, I got um, better uh, results in another um, generative AI, which is called pattern AI. Um, yeah, this is this one here. I will hop into here. Okay, I'll check the result here, monochromatic. Okay, sounds good. Here you can also feed in a negative prompt. Um, you could, um, for example, say, um, we don't want humans, um, no humans and uh, nothing organic. For example, because I only want um, some abstract letters and I set it here to one and let's generate a seamless pattern. Okay, I can download it here, for example. It seems to be seamless. And then I go to a very useful tool, um, which is called um, Seamless Texture Checker. I just drop in it here and, and you can check if it's um, a seamless pattern, if you see any seams here, but um, it's working here. And I can adjust the size to check um, um, if I like it here. Okay, sometimes um, shorter prompts um, work better. So we can do another check. Um, sometimes it's uh, too much text. Um, if it's um, shorter, um, it's... Uh, in some um, generative AIs, it's uh, easier. Um, and some generative AIs also have um, a limit, a character limit. So you can't feed in um, too much text. Oh, it doesn't give us any letters. No, no, no letters here. Uh, collage of maybe we put letters in characters. Oh, um, okay. Characters um, are human. I haven't uh, feed in that I don't want any humans. Uh, so um, alpha numeric um, letters. <clears throat> yeah. 
Yeah, so this looks better. Okay, you could also ask a chat GPT in this case, instead of um, tweaking the prompt on your own, um, just ask um, chat GPT to write a variation, another version. Um, I tried that, but I think you can do it on your own. Um, let's go um, to another kind of um, generation. Let's try um, music and soundtrack generation in Refusion. Um, um, in this case, I would first have to tell ChatGPT that it shall act now as a sound engineer and describe um, the kind of um, soundtrack um, style which would fit our uh, language learning game. I tell act as a sound engineer and composer. It suggests um, a bustling city atmosphere while also allowing the player to focus on learning. Some jazz and light classical music, sounds good. Should be warm and inviting. Okay, it, uh, it's a bit too long, this answer, condense your no, last reply. Okay, this um, this could fit um, within the character limit in Refusion. Okay, let's sit play. I hope you can hear the sound. I think you get you get the um, you get the idea. Um, generate. We could also try generating um, some basic code for shaders, but I think um, I will head over to my slide here and show you a demo video so that we can speed up a bit. Um, the Asha. Okay, I fed in a prompt in um, ChatGPT um, that it shall generate a basic code uh, for a shader. And in Unity, it's, uh, it's, it's a bit special. We have to use um, while programming a shader HLSL or CG in Unity. And uh, you can see here in ChatGPT, I wrote a prompt. Um, <clears throat> and immediately it starts um, generating the code in the correct uh, structure um, Unity uh, wants to see in a shader script. Um, the shader um, should um, be an animated one, a black, white, monochromatic, and um, will have a ray marching um, feature. This means that some lines um, will move um, over um, the material. I create here a new shader script and name it um, at name it the same name, give it the same name as ChatGPT did. I apply it to a material. Um, no, I, I, yeah, it gave me an error here. And in ChatGPT, I can tell um, that I found an error and um, I will also copy and paste um, the error message as well as the line of code, um, which has found the error and ChatGPT will fix it. Um, yes, I told in ChatGPT it, it shall fix it, and it gave me the new version of the script. I copy and paste it over in Unity, um, create a new material, apply the shader, and then um, uh, the material to the um, to my test cube. And you see, it's it's animating and way marching. Um, the, the lines um, are traversing over the uh, over the model. Over the yeah, over the um, surface. Okay, that's it. Um, I have here um, just another slide um, with um, two other examples of shaders. 
Um, here on the left side are my prompts. Um, yes, here are the prompts um, first and the second one. And you can see um, on the right um, in my GIF that um, it has worked. Um, I said I want yellow, blue, and red and black uh, rectangles, um, which are animated um, so that they move in a linear direction from zero to one, which is working here. And this is a simple <clears throat> basic um, fractal, fractal shader, um, a shader with a fractal pattern. So that's it from my side. I hope um, I can, uh, yeah, I want to head over, hand over and um, Crimson will continue our presentation. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> uh, I have to stop my um, Crimson. Do I have to stop my um, screen share? I can take over. Okay. Perfect. Thank you, Bernice. Uh, just one small reminder uh, again, feel free to post your questions on the QA tab. And uh, yes, we will we will share the recording for those who signed up. So it will come to your email. But what we are planning is also to share these prompts that has been used here and links, resources, everything uh, in one place. So um, feel free to uh, sign up for the event. I hope that you already sign up so you will receive not only the recording, but the prompts. So you can also try by yourself and see the difference. And the same thing for Crimson's presentation as well. Okay, great. Crimson, stage is yours. Awesome, thank you. Um, so yeah, since I started using ChatGPT uh, back when it was released, my workflow has changed dramatically. Uh, one of the biggest changes was the efficiency of uh, my general programming, um, doing things that were simple, but used to take like time, um, for example, like commenting out my code, like ChatGPT can really do that effectively. Um, and I just have to simply review it afterward um, instead of taking the time to do that. Um, so this has enabled me to do rapid prototyping very effectively so I can get a visible representation of an idea in front of people's eyes uh, much quicker than I would have been able to previously. Um, so in the following slides, we'll be walking through the progression of using ChatGPT effectively for software development. Um, yeah, so one of the most obvious use cases for programming with ChatGPT is directly asking it to write scripts and code for you. Um, so what I've done here is asked ChatGPT to create a script that will create cubes randomly and then um, change the colors of those cubes based off of key presses. Um, I also ask it uh, eventually to ensure the cubes that don't touch each other when they spawn. Um, so. Yeah, so my first prompt, uh, or this was my starter prompt for creating the cube. So this was a completely fresh instance of ChatGPT with no knowledge of what I'm doing beforehand. Um, and my starter prompt was asking Chat to write a Unity script that spawns a new cube when I press spacebar and then changes the color of all existing cubes when I press enter. Um, and this worked very effectively at the beginning, but as you can see, uh, with this image down here, it actually, you can only see one cube at a time, and that's because I didn't specify um, the position, of the, how the position should be changed when it spawns the cube. Um, so all of the cubes are overlapping onto each other. Um, so uh, one of the most powerful parts of ChatGPT is the ability to reprompt and modify code that you've used in the same thread. Uh, so that's what I've done here. I told it what was happening. Um, so that each cube spawns in the same location. And then I asked it to modify the previous script so that each cube would spawn randomly within a sphere with a radius of one. Um, and this was able to modify that code. It added one line and then modified another line to use the random position that it was able to generate. Um, this then was able to give me my somewhat of my desired outcome, but the cubes still have a chance of randomly overlapping with each other. So I then reprompted ChatGPT again, um, telling it to rewrite the script. 
so that when it spawns the cube, it does not let them touch each other. And if it's impossible to spawn a cube within the radius of one, it just wouldn't spawn a cube at all. Um, and this uh, gave me the behavior that I wanted, except for a small tidbit that I, with this, I did not realize what happened until, um, until it did. So basically I wanted it to continually, tr continually try and place a cube um, unless it was uh, absolutely impossible to place a new one, but this only loops through the existing cubes once. So I would actually need to refine this code further if I wanted it to give me the exact outcome I needed. Um, this was an example of progressively refining the code um, and is a way that ChatGPT is incredibly powerful and in can enable you to do uh, things that you wouldn't have previously been able to do in the time that you have. Um, so another use case of ChatGPT is to refactor existing code. Um, this allows you to quickly clean up code that was originally cluttered or messy. You can comment the code, you can break it into its own code blocks so it's easier to read. Um, there's really like endless possibilities. You can even provide design patterns for the code. Um, as long as you tell chat, chat GBT what it needs to do with the code, then it can pretty much do that um, most of the time, as long as your code is simple enough. Um, so in this example, I am in, still in the same thread with the code that it generated previously. So it has knowledge of the previous code. And I asked it to take the previous script and extract all code blocks of their own functions. Um, and as you can see here, it created the uh, spawn new cube function and then the change cube colors. And it was able to extract those out of the update function inside of Unity and place them into their own uh, readable functions that I can modify independently. Um, I would like to point out that you don't need to use an existing instance of ChatGPT to do this with the previous knowledge, I could have pasted the, the script that I had into ChatGPT and asked it to do the same thing. And as long as it has enough context, it can do that for you. Um, and this is very similar to commenting code as well. You can pass it in a script. And I, this one, I just told it to modify the spawn new cube function to and comment it. And it was able to add the comments explaining what was happening. So it generates a random position within a sphere. It checks if the new cube position would be close enough to the other cubes. And if it isn't close enough, then it would be able to spawn a new cube. Um, another incredibly powerful feature that ChatGPT has when it comes to programming is being able to debug code, um, even if it's code that ha it has never seen before. You just have to be able to provide it with enough context and then it's able to look at your code and change it accordingly. So because I wanted to stick with the code that we were familiar with, I took the spawn new cube function and I broke it uh, purposefully. I removed the cube.transform, I changed the condition for the distance check, and then I removed the break out of the for each loop. Um, and this function is incredibly broken and does not work at all for the use case that I had. So I created a new instance of ChatGPT, basically simulating as if I had written this function myself and I wasn't able to get it to work properly. Um, so I gave it the function, I told it the context of the function, and then it was able to generate the original function that uh, was working properly. Um, not only was it able to generate that function, it actually told me what was wrong with my code, which can be used to learn very effectively um, if you're struggling or failing to understand what your code is actually doing. Um, ChatGPT can often explain that to you. Um, I would like to point out that it only, point, it only explained two of the three bugs that I added into this code. Um, which is an example of how ChatGPT, while it is very powerful, isn't always 100% reliable with giving you all of the details and information that you need. Um, this script does work, but if I didn't know what was causing 
or if I didn't know to look for that break uh, in the for each loop, I may have not seen that it was there. Um, this leads into a perfect point. Um, ChatGPT can sometimes be wrong. Uh, it is very good at acting confident, but is always not competent with the answers that it provides. So it's important not to blindly use the responses from ChatGPT without making sure that they're functional. Uh, you do not want to put uh, ChatGPT responses into a production environment until you have thoroughly tested that it's working, uh, working for you. Um, always make sure that you're cross-referencing everything you do with ChatGPT with your own knowledge. And if that isn't enough, check resources online. Um, there are steps you can take that reduce the chances that ChatGPT will generate false information. Um, and one of them is learning the best way to leverage the AI. Um, so basically, I... Again, ChatGPT is very good at handling simple algorithmic problems, but it breaks down with complex systems, um, especially when those complex systems have many parts working together. So asking ChatGPT to generate those complex systems will almost always fail. It is often better to instead ask it to generate smaller chunks of code, and then you can personally go and place them in the, in the spots that they uh, should be within the script. Uh, let's take the code we generated earlier, for example. That script had two basic actions. It was to spawn a cube and then to change the color of the cube randomly. Um, because that was a simple enough problem, ChatGPT was able to do that. But to ensure that everything was functioning properly, it, it oftentimes you can save time by asking it to generate those functions independently of each other, and then you would go place them in the script. Um, in short, the less you generate at once, the easier it is to recognize when ChatGPT may have made a mistake and, what, and then you can act accordingly without having to sift through all of these other, uh, all of this other code that may also have mistakes within it. Um, so yes, split your code into smaller chunks. Also, there's a basic structure to generating code prompts with ChatGPT. Um, basically ask it, I, you ask ChatGPT uh, what it should be doing. So in this example, we are writing a script, um, but you can also do like write a function or write a single line of code, or you can even ask ChatGPT to write multiple scripts, though I don't recommend it. Um, that is an option. Then you specify what those scripts are going to be used for or in. Um, in this case for Unity, you can always or usually say Unity and it will generate C Sharp for you because that's what Unity uses. Um, but in other systems or APIs, like asking it to give you a certain programming language is almost always necessary. Um, then you give it the purpose of what you're asking it to do. So this one, I, this prompt that I am giving is to write a script in Unity that is used to track all objects in the scene. Um, so the basic functionality will be to track objects, but that won't be single. I mean, uh, that won't be uh, enough that won't have enough detail um, in order to get the functionality I want. So I tell it to use the singleton pattern for the script and then have functions that allow each object to register itself as a tracked object. Those are more details that you can provide after the fact. Um, you can give it in the same prompts, um, but it's often sometimes helpful to let ChatGPT generate its generic responses at first and then uh, be picky about the parts you ask it to change. Um, so ChatGPT can be used for many things and learning is definitely one of them. Um, so I, a couple months ago, I had no experience with 8th Wall, WebXR, or A-Frame, and I was basically able to teach myself the syntax in the way that 8th Wall uh, was able to function solely by using ChatGPT. Um, now this it takes an exploratory mindset because again, ChatGPT is not always correct. But it, and it doesn't always provide you with information that is equivalent to documentation. So using documentation plus chat GPT is often the most effective way to learn um, new skills that you're uh, entirely unfamiliar with. So the way that I did this with eighth wall was I was asking it to generate uh, A-frame components. And then I would 
not only was I able to learn the syntax of those A-frame components by looking at what ChatGPT uh, Chat generated, it also showed me different examples of functionality that A-frame was able to provide that sometimes the documentation didn't make apparent. So it exposed me to different ideas that I could use. Um, and this doesn't just apply to 8th wall, it can also apply to Unity. Um, I've done this with Python and creating Discord bots. Um, and it can be a really powerful way to learn new skills. Um, there are also external tools that use the same AI as ChatGPT. Uh, for example, I was able to use ChatGPT to help me generate a Discord bot that interfaced with ChatGPT. So you could actually go in a Discord server um, and use response commands similar to what Midjourney has, and it would respond to you with GPT-3 responses. Um, and then another example of the, these external tools is actually a tool created by uh, my friend, Stephen Hodgson. Um, he created a Unity plugin um, that interfaces with the RESTful API for OpenAI to generate Dolly and GPT-3 responses. Um, and that plugin for Unity supports all of the currently published endpoints and even has built-in models for fine-tuning to train your own custom AI models directly in your Unity editor. Um, and this is also what's going to be super cool about the future of ChatGPT is all of these tools that use uh, this AI, but you don't necessarily have to go to the website anymore. Um, it's going to change development as we know it. Um, so as with everything, uh, ChatGPT is an incredible tool and can be used to do some awesome work, but it's also important to have some fun with it. Um, so it also having fun with ChatGPT will also allow you to test its limits and know exactly what you can ask it to do and what you shouldn't ask it to do. Um, one example of this is there's a group of people that were able to get ChatGPT to simulate a Linux terminal. Um, and while I don't have a ton of experience with Linux, that was super cool. And I wanted to try and get it to simulate a Windows PowerShell terminal. Um, and while doing this, I was able to eventually uh, change the prompt uh, to get it to simulate PowerShell. Um, and I was able to navigate through the entire Windows directory as ChatGPT thought I should see it. Basically those files that were in the terminal I didn't exist, but ChatGPT was convincing me that they did with the output that it provided. Um, I then asked it to create a tic-tac-toe game called ttt.exe as a command line application and place it into the desktop directory. And I then when I went and I used the command line prompt to run the ttt.exe, it launched a tic-tac-toe game uh, very similar to what you're seeing in this GIF here, um, except it was in a command line terminal. Um, and the tic-tac-toe game was fully functional. Uh, I would like to also point out that, again, this was not a functional executable. ChatGPT was just responding in the way that it needed to convince me that the executable would have been functional had it been a real, a real file on the computer. Um, and I was also able to do this with a Flappy Bird Unity project. Um, I asked it to generate a simple Unity project in the desktop directory. And when I navigated to it, I was able to look at all of the scripts. And those scripts would have made a cohesive and functional game um, that I would have been able to play had it been a real Unity project. Um, so in conclusion, ChatGPT is an incredibly effective tool and can be used to increase the efficiency of developers pretty much no matter what they're doing. Um, having ChatGPT open on the side uh, at a moment's notice can often be incredibly helpful uh, with code generation, refactoring, commenting your code, or debugging scripts that you just have no idea why they are not working. Um, ChatGPT can also teach you new skills. Um, you just have to be careful with the way that you have it teach you um, and make sure you're cross-referencing uh, online tools as well or online resources. Um, and then that leads into the fact that ChatGPT is not always reliable, though it will try and convince you that it is. Um, 
And you may not have noticed, but in the tic-tac-toe game, it actually made a mistake. And I, that was in this previous slide right here. It tried to, or it played a spot in tic-tac-toe. It could have blocked me from winning, but it actually didn't. Um, and this is just uh, an example of where ChatGPT isn't always best at making decisions. Also, I had to tell it that it was its turn. It thought I was. It thought it was my turn after I already went. Um, so, um, so again, uh, also with ChatGPT, learning to prompt Chat ChatGPT is a skill, and it takes time and it takes practice. Um, so have one uh, fun with it, and always be uh, be willing to try new things and test it to its limits. Um, and thank you. I, if you are looking to connect with either Bernice or I, here's our social medias. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, uh, for this uh, in-depth presentation. I think there are so much to explore. We are just scratching the surface right now. So I'd love to uh, quickly go through the actually roundtable plus also the uh, Q&A session. I actually invited Chris and St Stephen, as well as Ian is also here. So I love them to take over actually the questions and then let's try to answer as much as, much as possible. Um, our team also just ask if you would like to see more of ChatGPT sessions, because there are many different creative or coder workflows that we can tap into. So feel free to also share your preferred workflow that you would like to see much more in depth. Maybe we can create more of that. Um, Ian, welcome, St Stefan and Chris, thanks for joining. So um, I don't know if, Ian, if you can see the uh, Q&A, but I'd love to quickly start the questions. Uh, or um, what we can do is, Bernice, on the art side, you can answer and take over some, one question, uh, and Crimson can take over uh, the coding-related questions. I hope you can see the questions. So um, let's start before we have uh, quite a bit of uh, questions right now. We have over 20 questions, so let's try to answer as much as we can. Um, oh, I um, see Ian. I hope he has already collected. <laughs> okay, questions. I cannot hear Ian now, but yes. Hi, everyone. Huh. Huh. I do Hi. have some, some hey. questions ready that we can go over on the panel. So I think a, a great question that has surfaced, and it's actually right here at the top, is so with all this information showing the, the tools that people can use um, by leveraging ChatGPT, one of the questions that came up is, well, which would do you think is a more important skill? Should I learn how to do 3D development or how to do XR development? Or should I learn how to do prompt engineering? I would say everything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> all. <laughs> you have to do all. <laughs> and I, specialize, uh, specialize in one field. Um, and prompt engineering, I think, will be important. Um, of course, if you want to use um, um, generative AI and so on. Um, just uh, we call it T-shaped um, people. <laughs> mm -hmm. So you have you have to um, know everything in every field and uh, specialize and focus on on one or two. Uh, I yeah. think that's the best direction. Yeah, it's also important to note that um, in order to be effective with prompting for these specific use cases, it, you do have to be able to use the software um, that you're prompting for. And no, um, if ChatGPT um, is um, um, generating the correct um, um, results, uh, you yeah. have to check. Um, and you, you can't rely 100% to it. So you, you, you have to know um, your, your stuff um, as well. You, you know some programming, you know some, something about uh, 3D and, and uh, image um, design generation in any case. Yeah. I have I have uh, seen one actually interesting post. Like uh, we are just in the beginning, right? Right now, uh, okay, we are combining different uh, AI-based tools into each other. But in my opinion, uh, we are also telling that in the XR prototyping skills, if you can combine your subject matter expertise, whatever it is, engineering, 
medical, you know, uh, or whatever you are good at in terms of uh, like subject matter expertise, if you can bring that AI superpower with that, I think uh, focusing on your very, very specific industry base or use case base workflow, I think, uh, and connecting this with, with the AI, relevant AI tools in the most efficient way possible, I think this will be the potential, maybe a job in the future as well that you can be really be called as prompt engineer. And the next level of that that I have been hearing is prompt based system engineer, which actually understand how you can transform not only one workflow, but the whole company uh, based on these AI tools. I think uh, we are not there yet, but I'm using the opportunity since this is a little bit like a philosophical question. I want to ask to St Stephen as well. Uh, hey, Stephen, we Crimson already mentioned about you, uh, your amazing uh, open AI contribution, but uh, would you like to say hi and then maybe answer this question from your point of view? Uh, sure, which question? Uh, the, the one that skills, like what kind of skills that we would like to prepare ourselves so we will be ready for the next two, three years of this exciting transformation. That's a very good, that's a very good question. Um, yeah, so thank you again, Crimson and Bernice for your wonderful lecture. You guys did a great job. Um, mm -hmm. And thank you for the shout out for my tool as well. Uh, yeah, so when it comes to some of the skills to learn, I mean, really, one of the things that I'm most actually kind of concerned about is, is how this might erode critical thinking skills. Because some people will go in and take what ChatGPT gives you, and they will just use the, what the answer that they give them. So um, that is actually one of my concerns. So I think above all else, any skill that anyone should ever really work on is, is problem solving and critical thinking skills. No matter what you do in your life, those two things will be the only thing that determines how successful you will be, I think, in the long run. So anyway, that's it for me. Thanks. Thank, thank you, Stephen. Uh, let's go through the questions very quickly, Ian. I just want to make sure that we don't have so much questions left behind. So let's have quick questions. Maybe you can combine some of them and then let's have quick answers from our experts in the round table. Yeah, we have some that we can go through. Um, one of them, a, a quick one about uh, AI animation is a great tool to look at is Move AI uses um, machine learning to track character poses. So you could have a room full of people and point a video camera at them and it will figure out the armature, everybody, and be able to like map motion to them. Kind of like doing mocap, but minus the suit. Um, it's still improving, but that's a, another tool that you can look at. There was another good question here, which was about competition to chat GPT. And I think, um, so yeah, so Stephen, I think you might have some good thoughts on like, this isn't, chat GPT seems very miraculous, but when you have an understanding of what it's doing and how it was built, this is not something that's out of the reach that people on this call, you could learn how to make something like this that's comparable. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, that's that's actually a good point. I was actually mentioning this in the chat uh, several times that you know, uh, ChatGPT is using OpenAI's ex pre-existing backend. the The only differences that they've done is is they have a really finely tuned model that they're getting lots of input back. Right. So when Bernice earlier she was talking in her lecture, she was talking about you know reinforcing the model with a thumbs up or a thumbs down. That is you giving the model feedback, and they're using that to incorporate changes and, and improving their model. You can do all of the same stuff with the API as it is today. So that's just an important thing to, to think about. Uh, not only that, but uh, as you do find trained models, like for example, ChatGPT, they probably have a really great crafted prompt uh, that is an assistant prompt that they have generated that then, you know, it gives it the persona of an assistant, right? So um, I think Computer File did a really great video recently about that uh, and how they do like a simulacra. You guys should check out that video if you haven't seen it. But uh, I think that they go to in really good detail about how GPT, the chat GPT specifically, will give you a persona or or something that it gives you back. So depending on the kind of prompt and the kind of give chat GPT that can really inform uh, the, the kind of results that you'll get. So 
at the end of the day, it's really about the prompt as well. So, you know, that's important. And then getting that feedback and incorporating that back into your model. So uh, if, if people really wanted to create a, um, you know, a competitor using OpenAI's same backend tools, I mean, that's actually possible to do. Like the, what they've done is is built on top of the the what they already have. So, um, and you could see what they've done with Microsoft has incorporated that into Bing now as well. And I have a feeling it's very similar uh, what they've done um, in, a, in a lot of ways, so. Thank you for the, the comprehensive answer. Yeah, so this, this stuff is definitely obtainable. We have a few um, other questions here, which are also along the lines of, um, so with generative AI, it is fed, it's, it's been uh, trained on a lot of this information and some of that uh, is copyrighted information. Any like thoughts on kind of navigating the, the, the material that's provided either both in code or in generative art? Uh, how does that overlap with kind of the copyright laws? My, my intuition is it's like many things. It's almost maybe like a, how drone regulation went for a little while where the technology <laughs> is moving at a much faster pace than uh, governance can keep up with it. And so uh, the, I, I'm sure the landscape will evolve. Um, there are some existing examples even of like GitHub's Copilot uh, program utilizing code that was copyrighted um and so like even the big players in the game uh that m mistakes can be made and this is a kind of an evolving landscape in terms of how we 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 grapple with ip and how it gets used um any thoughts from the panel on on where that may go it's difficult um i think um, i hope that generative ai will implement a kind of watermark so that we can um, identify um, results and, and material that was generated by AI. Um, but I think we, when we use a generative AI, we also have to be careful and uh, shouldn't upload um, um, input, um, which is um, copyrighted, I, I think. For example, I, I wouldn't um, have been allowed to upload uh, that um, painting by Fernand Léger to, to Midjourney, for example. It's probably not yet, um, uh, it's not yet free, <laughs> free to use, I think. Um, that's that's correct. Um, and uh, I have heard two, two months ago, China bans uh, AI-generated images uh, that don't have any watermark. I think uh, that's also maybe a little bit strict, uh, maybe approach, yeah. but that might be also eventual uh, decision making. Stephen, um, uh, yeah. Have... So, oh, yeah. So, uh, so my my take on this is um, I don't really see it as being that much different than artists and writers that are already consuming media uh, and internalizing it and creating something that's uh, a derived you know thing off of that. Um, now, there is some concern about whether or not it's recreating, you know, or taking that 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 encoded data and 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 mixing it up and spitting it back out. Um, and, you know, maybe there is something there to that uh, where, you know, you don't want somebody, you know, to to ingest that data. Um, but then at that point, like, you know, we see this kind of copyrighted data on the Internet all the time. That's not behind a paywall. Um, how do we, you know, th I think there's going to be a lot of changes to the laws and things like this. So um, I have a feeling that this is definitely a gray area and uh, it's going to be interesting to see whether or not the United States government uh, does, uh, you know, what the Chinese government does is kind of crack down on it quickly. Probably not, probably a free for all for a long time until, you know, somebody does something that finally, you know, um, uh, gets to the point where somebody's mad or loses a lot of money. I think that uh, there's another great video by uh, Corridor Crew where they kind of talk about this, and I'll link that as well in, uh, as well in in the chat. Yeah, that's a um, a great example. So yeah, definitely make make use of these tools. I, I, my general philosophy on this is um, the technology is a, a Pandora's box type situation. Nobody can put the genie back into the bottle now that this exists. And uh, it, it is going to be a part of the industry, even if the legislation changes. So it's definitely worth learning 
how to use these tools, um, especially because as it becomes a bigger and bigger part of our general workflow. So moving on to some of the other questions, um, another great one here is can ChatGPT generate code based on specific SDKs, for example, like using the Unity uh, Oculus SDK? Yes, absolutely yes. Um, there's a, like even a very specific tool that we use in XR Bootcamp called Odin Inspector. And I had questions about like, hey, how can I use this? I'm, I'm looking for this obscure tag that I don't really know what it's called. And I don't want to read the documentation because I'm lazy. And I just asked it a question. I'm like, how do I do this with Odin Inspector? And it happily gave me the answer. So even little more specific pieces of information, you can let it dive deeper and give you uh, surface information that you might might not have found. And it, for many things, it's often easier than like going to Google. It's a different workflow, but yeah, it can yeah. definitely help you with specifics. Ian, there's one more uh, follow-up question, which I know that you're interested in as well. The unit tests, can you create unit tests with, with ChatGPT? Is it possible? And maybe you can also explain what does unit test means for those who don't yeah. know. So a unit test in programming is, it's actually another piece of code that will run code and make sure that you get the expected output. So for example, if I have a number and it's supposed to scramble it so that you can't read it, which is like in a type of encryption that we use on the internet, you might have a unit test that scrambles it, make sure that you get gibberish and then unscrambles it and make sure that it's the same result. Uh, I have not personally utilized chat yet to write unit tests, but that seems like a great use case for it because writing unit tests requires a certain type of thinking and a very uh, kind of specific way to author these tests. And so help, using these tools to get you in the right mindset or get it to generate tests that are gonna um, be good, but just make sure that you're not relying on it. And again, like it could write a test that's incorrect or it's not testing the right thing. And a lot of it can come down to um, your direction of the tool, the how much you can articulate to it exactly what you needed to do. Just like with regular programming, often people that are writing code know my, my code is not working, even though I told it to do the right thing. And you find out that it was actually human error um, and it's doing the wrong thing. Steven. To be honest, I, a lot of the times I use it just because like I, I know what it is, but it's been so long since I've like looked at that API. I tend to use chat GPT more as like a sounding board just to make sure that I'm on the right track with some ideas. So it's just, uh, you know, again, one of those things where you just have to like take everything with a grain of salt and um, you know, reinforce the model, give it good feedback or, or, you know, remind it, help it train it, you know, that's an important thing as well. Definitely. So, um, another good question that surfaced in here is, has anybody used chat GPT as, um, kind of a, a conversational, uh, assistant in kind of modern games? And I wanted to highlight, there's actually a really good example. There's this uh, game from 2016 called Event Zero, I believe, which takes place on like a, a spaceship. And that was back using the original, ch uh, not chat GPT, but GPT-3 model to make a conversational AI. You find yourself in a spaceship and you need to figure out how to get out. And the way that you unravel the story is by talking to this artificial intelligence that lives on the ship. Um, and so this was now six years ago. Uh, um, I'm sure that there are people actively working on making new tools. In fact, even recently at the MIT Reality Hack, I had a, an incredible experience um, testing out one of the, the participants hacker project where they had um, an avatar that would spawn and you would talk to it and it would send responses off to chat GPT and talk back. And that was one of the most conversational uh, moments I'd ever had with uh, an artificial intelligence. And so that was like incredibly... Um, uh, inspiring to see like a, a whole character in AR talking back to me and asking me like really clever questions. So yes, there's stuff is on the way. Keep an eye out, watch the landscape as it, it's going to continue to evolve. A any thoughts there on, on cool projects you guys have seen where people are utilizing this technology? Yeah, I, I don't mind segueing. Uh, Jose had a question about this too, about combining unity and stable diffusion for like real-time environment morphing and things like this. Um, I have actually looked at implementing a stable diffusion like plugin for Unity, but it uses gRPC to communicate, not like a regular REST. So it's a little bit more difficult. Plus, there's a 
bajillion more parameters and options and stuff. So it makes it a little bit more difficult. But as far as like real time environment morphing and things like this, you remember it does take time to generate some of the responses and, and some of the things. So you're still going to get that, um, you know, that that lag time between uh, prompt and response. So I don't think we'll be seeing any real time uh, you know, tools, not only that, but I think open AI, they, they do suggest that you actually review a lot of the suggestions or a lot of the, the results before you actually make these live in your apps. So that is an important thing to keep in mind. So you guys aren't, uh, you know, reinforcing, uh, you know, negative biases into the models and things like this. So, um, just food for thought. I think it's great for, uh, a content development workflow, uh, but not so much as a, as a real time, uh, you know, generative thing at the moment. I just want to say that that's something I'm working on right now is how to make these things real time. And uh, exactly what you said is how do you regulate that? And so you're not getting like <laughs> questionable results. Um, that's probably the biggest issue, I think. And then making it fit the formats that you want uh, so that it can be real time. So that's that's what I'm actively working on. By the way, Chris is, uh, he already wrote on the chat, but uh, he's all, he was working at uh, AR glasses uh, at Meta. So anything uh, on the AR side, maybe Chris, you would like to share that maybe we cannot see now, but we will probably see in the future that can be nice combination of generative AI and AR. Yeah, I mean, I think that a lot of companies will probably use AI in the future to generate um, a lot of AR assets. It's just figuring out the best way to do that and the fastest way to do that. And so you can generate it once and then have it uh, exist in real time. Um, and and that, that process still takes time, like everyone's saying, but uh, you generate it once and then you can use it real time over and over and over again. And the more of those assets you have, uh, those are pretty valuable because you have prompts and things that go along with them. Um, and you start building a catalog. Um, like there's a number of companies that are kind of doing this kind of thing, uh, creating 3D models and whatnot from uh, just prompts. Amazing. Uh, actually, like when we say AR, AR uh, we should also take into consideration the voice SDKs because uh, the moment that we can actually create prompts with our own mouth, I think it might be interesting, at least maybe the the uh, simple ones, you know, because then you can bring a model or any uh, like an asset immediately to the uh, virtual environment. Um, I, I will go to the other info session now, but uh, I will leave the stage to Ian for moderation. We may take maybe a few more questions, Ian. Um, apparently there is a huge interest for the upcoming chat GPT focus event series. So 96% of the attendees want to have one more session. So uh, please write on the chat, uh, which kind of uh, creative or coder workflow that you would like to see in the next ChatGPT events. So our team will definitely uh, consider that and then organize another ChatGPT focus session with our uh, new uh, maybe lineup of experts. And we will also uh, record the chats uh, of this Zoom webinars because uh, I have seen that there are lots of nice links being shared. So we will be adding that to the um, supplementary document that we will share with you along with the recording. Okay. So Ian, the stage is yours. For those who would like to join the info session, uh, our team will, will also share the link as well. Okay, great. There's um an interesting question here that just came in, um, which is, so ChatGPT was trained on information up to a certain point and at that point, they had to cut off the model. They weren't feeding it any more information. It was just sitting and training and, and getting smarter. So if there's a new API that had come out recently, um, for example, like a geospatial API uh, that is not currently released, how might it um, be able to work with features like this? Um, there are some examples. I, I, I So like for a little while when, when ChatGPT first released, um, so it's not connected to the internet. Um, and 
there are already some examples online and maybe I can go find the repositories to share them back where people have found a way to get it to look at current information on the internet. It might even be able to go and con use the context previously of how it searched through to surface up information that um, is live right now. Like if you wanted to ask it about the weather that's going on, it'd be able to hunt there. So while yes, the main interface for chat GPT is uh, only trained on previous data in the past. Uh, I think that repository is another great example of how um, the developer community, the open source community will dive into these tools to enable them to go further, to do things that, that they uh, are, might be limited by. Um, and then also assume that there will be new models coming out in the future, trained on more recent information as we continue to improve them. Um, I think yeah. I saw another question here for when chat GPT-4 comes out, but I don't know when that will be. I think uh, Google, um, who is also working on a similar AI, will uh, benefit of um, uh, live data and uh, the data sets um, they have at disposal for training models will be huge um, and, and it's a clear advantage um, in comparison to, to open AI, I think. But, but you can train um, ChatGPT and um, tell um, ChatGPT um, the new um, information um, that's after um, 2021, for example. Um, I tried it once with um, um, a small script um, about um, XR um, Interaction Toolkit by, by Unity, um, this is framework, um, and it used um, an old and deprecated method um, in, in the generated script. And um, I said to, to ChatGPT, that's wrong as an old method to pick, pick the right one, <laughs> uh, pick the correct one, and um, it did it. I don't know why, but um, that worked. Um, however, you can um, always train um, ChatGPT and um, feed it with, with uh, new information. But, but you have to keep the same uh, thread, of course. If you switch, um, if you switch to a, a different uh, thread, um, ChatGPT will use um, all um, the information. Yeah, that the new tool, uh, Bard, I believe is the name, is uh, mm -hmm. promising to, to empower and, and kind of take it further. And that also seems like the next powerful step is like, well, this conversational AI is super helpful for kind of querying against the the database of information that is the internet um some of the more powerful use cases um or more personal use cases i suppose will be when it actually understands the kind of like what is important to you it may understand my calendar and what i need to do and give me a good summary of like what i need to do today when i wake up in the morning um it also falls under like again the similar territory of some people are uncomfortable with having that much data handed over to, to other people. And there's also one other piece I wanted to touch on, which is like part of the benefit on this right now is um, that these AI tools have the power to let us approach um, search or approach like information in a, in a new way where um, right now, a lot of like the Google assistant features and whatnot, they all have to go out and talk to, um, like a, a mainframe server in order to get information and stuff like stable diffusion, which can be run offline on your own GPU stuff like these custom models, um, that, uh, right now you'll still be done through an API, but they have the potential that this could be run locally. And it has like the ability to kind of disrupt and like roll your own, make your own stuff with this, that uh, is, is very powerful. So um, there was also a, another benefit on that. And Stephen, I saw that you answered this question on the side, which was about kind of like, how much do these tools cost to use? And also how would you handle like changes to the pricing possibly in the future? So even like there was a leak of like, or it was a leak or it actually came out about um, how much OpenAI was planning to charge for like a premium feature. I don't, I don't remember the price point Which, on that. What was it? Uh, the ChatGPT Pro? Pro, yeah. 
Yeah, so that's why like, I was like, that's why I was like, this is crazy. Cause I mean, oh, I mean, I guess it depends. If if you want to use the the API as it is, it's gonna be a lot cheaper than if you're to subscribe to Chat GPT Pro. It's effectively just the web interface, right? But it's effectively the same thing. Don't get me wrong, if you feel like that it's helpful for you and you don't want to go and, and code your own thing, you should definitely go support the product because it's a great product. Obviously, everybody has blown it up on the internet and has become the next big thing, right? So, you know, if you feel like it's worth the, the value, then please go pay for the software, okay? I, I implore you guys. It's important that you guys pay for software, okay? <laughs> um, and that's an important thing. Now, what's interesting is is I was just answering a couple questions uh, as well in the Q and A. Somebody had, um, you know, asked, you know, uh, what is the, you know, is it possible to, um, you know, do internal private API documentation? And they they were concerned about, um, you know, possible legal issues there. Uh, Microsoft actually has its own open AI on Azure instance that you can host yourself. So you can literally host your own open AI instance in Azure where it's sandboxed and, you know, firewalled behind a, a, a backend, but you do need to do all of the model training yourself. They do provide you the models, uh, out the box, but you probably need to go in and fine tune those to get them closer to what you want. So, um, now that's probably going to be much more expensive, but you know, uh, it depends on what your use cases are and 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 whether or not it hits the value add, right? So that's why we live in a capitalist society. <laughs> it'll it'll the market will will, you know, correct itself. Um, sure. I just yep. just want to say that that we will share our slides later after this session. Because um, several people are asking me on this quest, um, we will share them. So uh, keep an eye on um, on Discord. Maybe um, um, I think our hosts will will share the link then. Um, so we have another question that was from Aaron, which was about. So can you use Chat GPT to kind of create sockets and networking communication between? Uh, two different paradigms or uh, different environments. So for to give an example, if you had um, Python and you needed to send outputs over to Unity in like a C-sharp script, could you author it to do that work? Um, say yes, it's definitely possible. It will provide you with the code. You can best enable yourself if you know the vocabulary uh, and you know how to work with these programs in order to direct it to give you the output that you're looking for. Um, any thoughts on some interesting use case, like that's any, any thought on use cases where you, you have it um, bridging gaps, either technical gaps or knowledge gaps um, using chat. Um, I was actually trying to do this exact thing uh, a couple weeks ago. And this is a great point of like be having knowledge of what you're working with is just as important as being able to ask questions to chat GPT. Um, because for me personally, I had never done something with sockets before um, with, with that type of use case. So when it was generating these, what seemed to be really complicated responses uh, for me, for someone else, they, um, if they had known the vocabulary, it would have been a lot easier. Um, for it to do. It did give me a great starting place. Um, and I went and was able to go and do my own research on um, how sockets would work in this type of environment. Um, and so it, it gave me a starting point. Um, but with no knowledge, it wasn't able to fully give me what I needed to implement. I had a slightly different experience um, converting things to electronics, um, like embedded electronics, and it did a pretty darn good job with that. Um, so converting things from like Unity code and creating animations and things that I am more familiar with generative graphics on that end, I was able to convert into um, Python code that would run on, uh, you know, embedded electronics using libraries that would work in those um, ways. But you do still need to know, you know, a, a good amount of electrical engineering or at least coding for it to like be able to understand it. Um, 
because it made a few mistakes and then I was able to like correct it just through chat GPT. Um, I, I do want to bring up one more thing that I've seen in uh, the Q&A a little bit that keeps coming up. Um, and it's, you know, how can we protect people from abusing uh, these tools? Um, and I've had to kind of link this a few times, but, you know, uh, part of OpenAI's, you know, safety best practices is to use the moderation API. It's a free call. All you have to do is send your result back and it's a free API call. Okay. Mm -hmm. So use that. Uh, also, remember to keep a human in the loop whenever possible. They recommend having a human review all the outputs before it's used in a live app. Okay. I want to emphasize that for people. All right. So this is just part of the ethics behind what we're doing, guys, uh, you know, so that we can continue to have a nice, you know, sandbox to play in because there's always going to be bad apples out there that are always going to ruin it for everybody. Okay. So um, it's important uh, not only to safeguard yourself if you're a developer, um, but also people that are going to be using your products and services that you're going to be creating with these things, okay? For sure. There's even, um, if anybody's seen the, the live stream, Watch Me Forever, that was a very interesting example. Oh, it just got taken down. There. And it did just get taken down because yeah. it was not being uh, moderated and the AI said things that are inappropriate and, and offensive and uh, the stream got taken down for it. So it's a, a prime example of like, even though it, it can do it, you really need to have somebody there to review what's going on. Um, yeah. Any other... Um, questions that we're seeing in the chat that we'd like to surface and bring up i'm reviewing now too to try to pick some out uh is there anything we could do to condense the result uh the results from chat gpt by default it seems like that would be the efficient way to do it um i suppose you could include that command in your original prompt to say give me a condensed output and it should do that into I do yeah. suggest not doing that first uh, firsthand. It may seem like it may save time, but if your initial prompt would have generated something that you don't like, uh, having the extra detail before you condense it um, is, is just nice to see mm. and provide good output. Yes, I agree, I agree. It's better to have um, at first uh, some more detailed uh, result from ChatGPT and then um, break it down uh, and, and um, shorten it a bit. Yeah, then you can ask it to specifically remove details that you don't mm -hmm. like um, instead of it just condensing everything in general. Oh, there's another great question here, which is about uh, so can I use um, Midjourney or Dolly to utilize a character that we already have in our product range and then be able to have that be part of its output by basically um, inserting new data that was not included into the training model? Uh, um, yes, um, I think so. You would um, prepare an image prompt, um, upload to Midjourney um, images uh, or several images um, of your um, character. Um, or, or of the product for, ex product, uh, for example, and uh, then um, um, it, uh, mid journey will use some kind of a style transfer and uh, generate um, new um, pictures um, of it. It's definitely possible. Um, it's um, even possible to feed in um, not only one single um, image prompt, as you have seen in my um, live demo, but you can um, also feed in uh, several images, I think up to um, four or five. I don't know. And you can also apply um, um, weights um, so that you say the first image um, is the most important one. It will get the weight of um, 0.7, for example. And the other three um, input um, um, image prompts will just have a weight of um, 0.1. Um, so you can manipulate and um, control um, a bit the, the, the outcome of Midjourney. It's definitely possible, I think. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Another great example is on the stable diffusion side of things. Um, you'll have a, a checkpoints file or a, a model file that's been trained. 
you can use a tool which is called stable dream fusion dream fusion which is for feeding in a, an image set of like i could feed in a bunch of images of my face or i could feed in a bunch of photos of my dog and then i could say draw a photo of me and my dog smiling on top of a mountain and it would know my face and it would know what my dog looks like and be able to add those into the data set so there are definitely tools that exist um, mm. to enable that workflow yes and there are also other generative ais um which are spe specialized on image um, generation and, and you can train your own um, data set um which is uh, specific to your project for example through we're um drawing to the end of our questions are there any tools for using ai to generate 3d assets yet <laughs> i'm i'm waiting for i have to say um there is for example a masterpiece masterpiece ai um, which um, has announced um, such a feature so that we can generate 3D models um, just with a text prompt, but it's not yet um, publicly accessible. <laughs> but you can sign up um, for, for the beta version, I think. Uh, but it's not yet released. And I know that Google is also working um, on um, a similar um, generative AI um, for, for 3D modeling and NVIDIA, I think, too. Um, I think it's just a, uh, a question of a couple of months or weeks, even weeks. I don't know. What, what's your opinion, Crimson and Ian? Yeah, Luma AI also uh, has a tool that they just, uh, I think it's still in beta right now, but there it does generate 3D models pretty effectively um, with good prompt engineering. Um, doing stuff in real time if that's your goal is definitely a really uh, is quite a bit a ways away um but getting 3d models i think is pretty close yeah definitely a second on luma that um program imagine is uh now starting to roll out to more people if you're interested in getting access to it i'd recommend joining their discord and communicating with them there and they can I, I've been utilizing it. It's pretty cool um, to generate some characters and then bring them into Mixamo and animate them. It's it's pretty powerful. And then I also wanted to give a little correction because I actually realized I said the wrong thing earlier. The tool for generating a custom model is not stable Dream Fusion. That is Google's paper for how to generate 3D models. The tool for generating custom models is called Dream Booth. There's a lot of very similar terminology between them and just like a small mix up there. But uh, so yeah, those are the, the ones that are currently um, available for generating 3D assets uh, using artificial intelligence. And I'm sure there will be more on the way. Um, so we are coming up towards the hour. I think we can take three more questions. Um, can go through. So if you have any that you've been sitting on, feel free to add them into the Q&A uh, and we'll get to them. And yeah, let's go through. I'll see if there's any. So yes, the slides will be shared after this. For anybody who missed the opening part, we'll share um, our, uh, we'll be sure to share out the resources, both the recording of this presentation and then also uh, the prompts and the, the slides for this so that you guys can dive into this information further. Cool. Well, I want to say thank you to Bernice and Crimson again uh, for the wonderful lecture you guys had. We really appreciate uh, that you guys took the time to do this. And uh, thank you again for the XR Bootcamp team uh, for hosting this event. Yeah, uh, thank you for having me. It was a yeah, thank pleasure. you. And uh, yeah, thank you um, to you, Crimson. <laughs> it was a nice um, time with you. Thank you. Yeah, and thank you everybody for coming to check out the presentation. Glad you're all excited about these tools and want to learn more. Um, keep an eye out for those uh, resources from us in the future. 
And if you're interested in XR Bootcamp, feel free to join our Discord server. Uh, we're always happy to talk about the current ongoings in the XR industry and how you can learn to be a part of it. So thank you everybody for coming. It's great to uh, have you. Thank you, thank you, Ian. <laughs> thank you everyone for joining. Bye. Yeah, thank you. Great. Bye all. <laughs>